1975 Avalon had been built and it was decreed by the management of the place that they wanted a, a pop show of some sort or at least a contemporary music show and um, the producer that was setting that stuff up, a guy called Mark Westmoreland who is no longer with us, basically knew of what I was doing in the music. At that stage in fact I was playing in the Quincy Conserve which was quite a well-known band and we would travel a lot around New Zealand and um, I knew I had a pretty deep understanding of what was going on locally, musically around the entire country from all that travel and playing in Wellington, etc. So uh, he said, look, come and join the production team. I did. I didn't have a clue what the hell I was supposed to be doing. The job wasn't really defined, but ultimately he ended up helping with sort of talent coordinating, you know, who was to be on the show and some, you know, help with the programming of the music, etc. The show I was working on was called Grunt Machine, which was good. It was kind of eclectic rock. It had a number of madcap presenters, probably the most famous being Paul Holmes. We had bands on set in Studio 8 such as Split Ends, Phil Judd, I mean, all the bands that were happening at the time, Ragnar Rock, um, Space Waltz, etc. Uh, it was a great show, but after a year, management thought what was really needed was a, a pop show, you know, a chart-based show. So Grunt Machine morphed really into, into Ready to Roll. It was the beginning of the clip revolution really, so we were getting kind of live performance orientated looking clips, but there wasn't enough to make an entire show. So the lion's share of what existed musically on Ready to Roll was cover versions of, of local artists doing international hits. Um, and uh, I never felt comfortable with it, but hey, that was it, and I wasn't calling the shots in those days, but it, it kind of had to have other content in there. And we also had uh, a number of um, visiting bands. Oh, Gary Glitter, I, I mean, I, I, I remember distinctly walking down to the dressing rooms and Gary Glitter had summoned someone down to give him a hand and he came storming out of the dressing room with his glitter suit, which of course he wore in those days, and threw it at me and I sort of caught it, thank God, uh, and it was like a suit of armour, it was so heavy, and uh, he said, there's two sequins come off, you know, go and go, go to wardrobe and get this fixed, so I sort of motored off down to wardrobe and got the sequins back on and took it back to Gary. It was kind of a change. The producer job also was up for grabs. Um, I thought, cripes, I might as well have a crack at it. And in 1980, applied for the job, despite much derision with um, establishment in Television New Zealand, namely other producers and directors, I ended up with a job. I'd always been up until this point on contract. I was the kind of outside connection to the, the music world. Philosophically, I really never was comfortable with cover versions. and. I really, although things had been morphing a little bit prior to my time producing, I really wanted to sort of rid the program, particularly Ready to Roll, or RTR as it was known, of cover versions. And I really had a firm belief that, you know, original music was what really had to happen in New Zealand and I wanted to promote that. Um, it wasn't happening huge. I mean it was happening in the 70s but not hugely. And, Radio airplay wasn't happening, the music industry was a little bit depressed and I thought well look, let's push the original thing. So really um, I stopped uh, cover versions and basically focused on bands who were writing original material and I started um, getting involved in making uh, pop videos or rock videos. What was happening at that point in time is the, 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 the Clips were really trucking in fast from overseas, so we were getting so much material. RTR eventually moved to Saturday night prime time, and it, it only existed of six, maybe seven clips, number one being one of them. It was a chant based show. The show became a hit machine. The first thing I did was liaise very closely with radio stations and sent them out content lists of the new releases, as we called it, and high flyers that were on the show which I sort of um, chose in conjunction with the record companies, you know, what they were punting for that particular week, but essentially it was my editorial choice at the end of the day. So we'd send them out lists, and the radio stations around New Zealand, pretty much nationally, would playlist those tunes three days before RTR went to air. So the public generally um, would be aware of these tunes. On Saturday, RTR would play. That awareness would be cemented by the video clip, and pretty much almost always a week after those charted in the top 10. 
So it became a real hit machine, a bit like Countdown in Australia. Who was choosing those songs? I was. So I you was. were in an incredibly powerful position. Right? It, was, it, it was powerful in the sense that uh, I was sort of plagued by record companies kind of wanting their clips on. And it was, you know, I, I would arrive in the morning and, <laughs> you know, there would be someone waiting on the line from CVS or, or, or Festival or wherever trying to sort of get in my ear as to potentially what to playlist the next week. But, you know, really it came down to, for me, the music, the quality of the tune, the quality of the clip. In those days it was getting, as in 1980, the quality was getting amazing. You had great directors internationally, Russell Mulcahy, so I mean a whole bunch of people. The quality in the production was just fasc fascinating. And of course the track record internationally as well, you know, whether there'd been a major hit in America or the UK or whatever. Of course I was playing local stuff and that tended to um, you know, where I could, where I felt a song was, was suitable for, you know, that format, I would playlist that um, Ready to Roll. But the, the main thing with Ready to Roll is that the ratings were one point, you know, pretty much around one million every Saturday night. Sometimes I think the highest was 1.2 million. We'd spar constantly with network news as to who was the number one program of, of each week. It was a great slot and, and um, you know, as a, had a hugely loyal audience for around about seven years through that period of 80 to 87. There were in-house directors, uh, to name a few, Brent Hansen, um, Simon Morris, Barbara Gascoigne, quite a few over, over the years. Who we made, where we made videos within Avalon in Studio 8, and they were videos. I mean, there were limited facilities back back in the early 80s, nothing like you have now. Um, but essentially, you know, the bands would come in, and they would be responsible for making making clips for bands. Um, the second tier was uh, I, where I thought there was some really interesting, high quality music going on and original music. Um, I would, and also the, the desire to actually. Um, encourage and develop independent filmmakers. I commissioned um, people such as Bruce Morrison of the day and others to actually go out on location and shoot clips on film using special effects etc and I'm, there are multiple examples of those you know I probably ended up with you know well, over the time 50 or 60 clips but I mean I'm talking Billy Bold, Hello Sailor, um, Dance Exponents, um, it goes, the list goes on and on. With the Flying Under Needham thing uh, really wanted to develop that. There was an in-house film cameraman down in Dunedin called Peter Jaynes who we used to slip film stock and, and he in his own time and he, he was a great guy would, 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 would churn out clips of, of you know various flying nun bands, the Verlaines, you know, Toy Love, the, the Chills etc. About 86 when I was approached by the presentation section to, um, who knew my background to write some music uh, for the station ID. It was only a five second sting. It was a very simple little piece and um, uh, you know it was used for several years. <laughs> Just after that, just at the end of 86, early 87, Steve LaHood approached me about whether I'd be interested in writing all of the music for a drama series he was producing, uh, written by Fiona Samuels called Marching Girls. I sort of jumped at the, the opportunity. It was the sort of crunch I said to myself, I'm enjoying this so much that perhaps it was time to sort of quit television and set up my own production company. Basically me just writing music for television, uh, even though it didn't pay as much. I felt more comfortable writing themes for television, writing documentaries, dramas, and a lot of, yeah, a lot of themes like one news themes, close up, Paul Holmes, all this Paul Holmes, a lot of the Paul Holmes stuff, um, Q and A, which is on at the moment, Lion Man, which has been the most successful selling series in New Zealand, selling to 120 countries. You're restricted by the visuals in front of you, the script the acting, a whole gambit of things. Um, you have to sort of really not totally go with your emotions. You don't have real freedom. When you compose for yourself, which is fundamentally what I'm really interested at this point in time of doing, I still like to do television, but essentially I want to travel down the path of going back to performing live, almost how I started, but I want to do an original thing. Um, uh, and I'm interested in jazz, and of course certainly contemporary jazz, and I've written an entire repertoire of tunes uh, which I want to record, and I'm currently rehearsing with a jazz trio where I like to play here and internationally. Um, 
basically you have ultimate freedom. I think everyone wants freedom and, and particularly in music you really want you don't want people telling you what to do. You don't want the strictures of a brief. Um, you basically want open slather and creativity and to go wherever you want. And that's what basically inspires you and what inspires other people to like your music. And to me, that ultimately is what it's all about. <laughs>